Good evening, everyone. Merry Christmas. Well, as I was saying, if some of you guys have been to one of our Good Friday services in the past, um, we have an evening where we really take our time kind of reminding ourselves of the whole story of, uh, of Good Friday uh, and the events of, of that particular evening. Tonight, we're going to do the same thing, but for Christmas Eve. Uh, and we're going to really reflect on what Christ has done for us. Now, if you remember, for our Good Friday service, uh, we have a lot of the adults that participate reading Scripture uh, as part of that story. Uh, tonight, we're going to have the kids be doing that for us. Uh, so throughout this evening, as I walk through the story of what Christ has come to do for us, we're going to have our kids interacting. And also, kids, I need your participation as I ask you a few questions as we go. You guys always do such a fantastic job. In a, yeah, we got, we got the, the number one fan back there in the back who's always ready to go, locked and loaded. Um, but as we go through this night, we're also going to take some time to weave in out of a couple songs too, um, just like we do for Good Friday or maybe for a prayer and worship night. So we'll kind of walk through some of the story and then we'll sing about that part of the story uh, as we go through tonight. So long ago, way long ago, the way the story begins is there was a king who created his kingdom. He created really the whole entire world. He, he created the universe. And as part of this kingdom, he chose to even kind of appoint even like a prince, so to speak, someone who would actually oversee his kingdom. All right, so this king of the universe has this prince. Now, kids, you guys want to take a guess what that prince's name was? Ooh, that's a good, that we're getting ahead of ourselves. Who's the first person to ever kind of oversee the earth? The first human. Adam, that's right. So the king creates the universe. And then he says, I'm going to make this, this prince, so to speak. He doesn't want, isn't called Prince Adam, but he's kind of like a prince. And he says, I want you to oversee my kingdom. Now this prince also had a princess. What was her name? Eve, that's right. So we have Adam and Eve. They're given this job to oversee this kingdom. Now, when it comes to a kingdom, kids, what happens when uh, a kingdom has another kingdom that wants to come in and take over? What happens? A war, a battle. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a bad thing. The bad thing. <laughs> Every single year, these kids confound me. <laughs> So this Prince Adam, he's kind of getting lazy with overseeing this kingdom. And he lets this other kingdom, this other prince of this kingdom of darkness, this prince comes in and makes war. What's the name of that prince of darkness? What would you say? Satan, that's right. So he brings in this kingdom of darkness. Now, in this kingdom, we have things like sin. We have death, we have disobedience. We have pain, we have sorrow. And the story of Christmas that we celebrate every year, this story is really about a kingdom. It's about a kingdom and it's about war. Christmas is about war. We don't often think of it that way, but it is. It's a war between two kingdoms, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of darkness. Now, all growing up for myself, uh, I considered myself a pretty good kid. Kids, raise your hand if you think you're a pretty good kid. Okay, all right. You guys that didn't raise your hand, good for being honest. <laughs> now, I thought to myself, because I thought I was a pretty good kid, I, I'm, I'm clearly with the good guys. I'm with the good kingdom, right? I'm on God's side. That's what I always thought growing up. I'm part of the kingdom of God. Because in my mind, I always thought to myself, well, I'm not that bad, right? I'm not, I'm not that bad of a kid. And then a few years go by and at age 18, I, I heard actually what the Bible actually says about God and what it says about us. So our first volunteer, Easton Noel, where are you at, bud? You're going to come and share with us, tell us about what the Bible says about the reality of where we are in place of and in, in light of who God is. And this is a verse that changed my life when I was 18. Not, 
None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned to sky. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 10 through 12 plus and 23. Awesome. Thanks, bud. That is a crazy truth, and that truth changed my life when I read that in black and white when I was 18. And when I, I, I read that, I'm, I'm sitting there going, okay, but all have fallen short. No one is good. No one's truly actually good in totality. No one's righteous. This totally changed everything, how I saw myself. Yet I still said to myself, but I'm, I'm still, I'm not that bad. <laughs> I can't be that bad. And that was my problem. I thought I only did little sins. But what makes sin so bad isn't really just what we do, but it's who we do it against. So kids, I'm going to ask you a question. Is it bad to lie to a friend? Yes. Okay. Now, what if you lie to a police officer? Is that, is that worse? It is, right? Even though it's the same thing, a lie is a lie. But if you lie to a friend versus lie to a police officer, you're going to get in bigger trouble. You lie to a police officer, you could go to jail. Right? So it's the same exact sin, but it, what depends on how, how bad a sin is, is really it's against whoever it is. It's terrible to lie to a friend, but if you lie to a police officer or a judge, bigger consequences. What's worse, kids? Spilling coffee, or oh, you guys don't drink coffee, do you kids? No? Maybe soda, right? Spilling coffee or soda on an old t-shirt with holes in it. Is, is that worse or is this worse? Spilling soda on a wedding dress of a bride on the day that she's getting married. What, what's worse, right? Even though it's the same exact thing, you spilled coffee on a garment, but it's worse depending on what you spill it on. That's what makes a particular mistake or a sin worse than another sin that's the exact same thing. My very first car uh, that I got, I was, I was 14. I had got a Burgundy 1984 Chevy Celebrity. That thing was awesome. Now, it was a bummer when I would wreck that car, which I did from time to time. But what would be worse, wrecking that beautiful piece of machinery or wrecking a McLaren F1 that's worth $20 million? What's worse? The second one? Yeah, the second one, right? Same exact thing, little fender bender, scratch some paint, whatever. But what depends is the value of the thing that we're sinning against, that we're making these uh, whether it's an accident or it's spilling coffee or whatever it is. See, small sins aren't small when they're against a big God. There's really no such thing as a small sin. When you sin against the king of the universe, there's no such thing as a small sin. Kids and adults, all of us here, the truth is that all sin is sin. Small sin to a policeman or against a wedding dress or an exotic sports car suddenly becomes a huge sin. Small sins become huge. And the truth is that all of our sins are against a holy God. Caleb Adams, where are you at, bud? We need you to tell us from God's word about what this sin does when we sin against God. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 2. That your sins have made a separation with between you and your God, and your sins has, have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Yeah. Thanks, bud. Committing a crime and going to jail separates us from our families, right? You commit a crime, you go to jail, you're separated from your families. In the same way, just like Caleb just read, sin separates us from God. That's what it does. And so at 18, I thought to myself, well, I need to get to work now and I need to be a good person. I need to pay God back so I can join the kingdom of heaven. But there's really, there's no way to pay him back. So uh, kids, let me, let me ask you a question, okay? Chase, you, let's say you have your brother give you $10, okay? And then you lose the $10. Do you think somehow you might be able to pay him back eventually? Yeah, okay. All right, that, that's, that's good. Now, what if he loans you a billion dollars and then you lose that billion dollars? Do you think you'll be able to pay him back someday? 
<laughs> Someone has got a lot of faith in Chase. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I probably agree. I think maybe someday you could, but probably not, right? You get 10 bucks from someone, you lose it. No big deal. You can pay them back. But if you get a billion dollars and you lose that, that's going to be a hard time paying them back. See, during a war, what happens is the enemy takes hostages and the enemy asks then for a ransom. They'll say something like, well, we'll let you go, but only if you give us a billion dollars. Now, because we've chosen to sin, we become prisoners then of the kingdom of darkness. And we can't afford the ransom payment to get out. We can't afford to get out of this kingdom of darkness. That's the bad news. That's the bad news. But there is good news. But before we get to that good news, we're going to sing about this war. And we're going to sing about the hope that we have that God sent someone to save us amidst this war. So Chase and Tanner, come on up, read us from the word about this war. First John 3, 8. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. John 16, 33. Jesus said, I have said these things to you, that in me you, ha you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Yes, Lord, the enemy came to make war, but you, God, you were born to bring life and peace. Hannah Chin, why don't you come up and let us know from the words of Jesus himself what he said to us about him and what he's brought to the earth. So Jesus says in John 10, 10 through 11, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Amen, you guys can be seated again. So right after that, that prince of darkness took control, that prince of darkness that came to, to kill and destroy, just like Hannah just read to us, God promised that he would send a new king to rescue us. The first prince, Adam, he, he failed. Everyone after him failed, but God promised that he would send a new king to rescue us. Now, kids, did you know, you guys probably remember this from last year, maybe, but did you know that Christmas is actually mentioned in the very first book of the Bible, thousands of years before Jesus was born, Christmas was actually mentioned in the first book of the Bible. In Genesis chapter three, here's what God says. God is speaking to this prince of darkness, all right, this enemy. He says, I'm gonna put enmity, that means strife or a battle or uh, war. I'm gonna cause war and strife to be between you, prince of darkness, and all the human beings that are born in this earth. There's gonna be a battle between the two of you, between your offspring and her offspring. But eventually there's gonna be a man, he says, that's gonna bruise your head, he says to the Prince of Darkness. He's gonna give you a wound on your head. Now you're also gonna hurt him, but he's gonna hurt you worse. God said that there would be an ongoing war between people, between us and Satan and sin and evil but that eventually there would be a human that would be sent by God to defeat sin and death for us. And that human would come to rescue us and establish his kingdom of heaven forever. And he also said that the darkness would not be able to beat the light ever. The prince of darkness would be conquered by the Lord of light. Silas Wargo is gonna come up and tell us about this light that cannot be beat by the darkness. I, I love this verse here because it tells us so much about the power of God versus the quote unquote power of the enemy. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made in him was life and Life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, 
and the darkness and the darkness has has not overcome it. Thank you, bud. Nice job. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Kids, you guys know what a flashlight is, right? Yeah. Do you know what a flash dark is? You know why you don't know what it is? It doesn't exist. Right? Think, think about this. You can have a flashlight that has even just the smallest little light and it can light up enough to see in front of you. But have you ever even thought about the concept of a flash dark? Right? Like you open up your, your phone or a flash dark and, and all of a sudden it makes a light room dark. That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't work because darkness cannot overcome light. Light always wins. Light is always stronger than darkness. There is no such thing as a flash dark because the dark cannot overcome the light. Now the Bible gives us a, a description of who this new king is going to be, what this human is going to look like. And sometimes on a Sunday or maybe, you know, on a baseball field or something like that, I might meet someone new, right? When you meet someone new, I'll, I'll, I'll go home and I'll tell my wife and, you know, she'll say, oh, what, what, do they, what do they look like? Would it be helpful if I told my wife, well, they've, they've got a nose, they've got a couple eyes, they've got some ears. I mean, is that going to help her know who this person is? That's not going to help, right? What would be more helpful is if I really described unique features or maybe how they would dress or if they had an accent or not. Now, God didn't say, hey, this new king that's going to come and rescue, he's going to be a man with a nose and a couple eyes and a couple ears. He actually gave us a much more detailed description of what we can be looking for so we would know who this king is. So we would know who this rescuer is. And I share this part every year because I feel like it helps us really see how, the, how specific the descriptions are so that we would know, so we would know that God actually planned this for us. On the back of your notes, you can take these home with you, of course, and, and look through more of these. I'm just going to highlight a few of them. But here's some of the things that the Bible said about this rescuer hundreds of years, even thousands of years, before this rescuer would even be born. So the Old Testament says this guy is going to be born in Bethlehem, tiny little town. Even though he's born in Bethlehem, he's going to be raised in Galilee, which is a totally different region. So that'd be like saying about me, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm born in Los Angeles, but I lived in South Dakota. Then I was, I was an adult in San Diego. Like, that's really specific. Not only that, but his family's going to spend time in Egypt together as well while he, they flee to save his life. A few others. A friend of his is going to betray him by handing him over to the authorities for 30 pieces of silver. That's pretty specific. His clothes are going to be gambled for. He'd be scourged and crucified, even though crucifixion actually wasn't even invented at the time that that was written. People are reading that going, what does he mean? They're going to pierce his hands and his feet? That doesn't make any sense. What kind of punishment is that? We've never heard of that. It says that he'd be buried in a tomb that's owned and donated by a rich man. I mean, you might be able to control some of the prophecies about yourself, you know, like you can move to a certain place, say, oh, look, I live there. But how can you control where you're buried? How can you control the things that happened after you died? And the Bible says that all of this would happen before the Jewish temple would be destroyed, and that happened in 70 AD. So all this had to have happened before 70 AD. So someone before 70 AD had to be the person to fulfill these prophecies. Now, I just gave you eight. I gave you eight prophecies. To fulfill eight prophecies at random, you would have a one in, well, the, the actual number is 100 quintillion. That's a real number. Kids, you know that number? Can you count to 100 quintillion? <laughs> That's one with 17 zeros after it. That's a lot of zeros. It's <laughs> a lot of zeros. That's just to fulfill eight. Now, to fulfill 30 prophecies, here's what you'd have to do. You'd have to hollow out nine earths. Picture how big the earth is. Hollow out nine earths and then fill them with dimes. All right, so a little dime's filled, nine earths. You paint one dime red, and then you get blindfolded, and you're told to pick one of the earths, and you have to swim through the earth and you gotta find the one red dime blindfolded. Do you think you got a pretty good chance of doing that? 
I would say probably not. <laughs> the same person probably who had faith in Chase. <laughs> There's no chance that you're going to find that red dime. And that's just to fulfill 30 prophecies. Jesus fulfilled 300 specific prophecies written about him hundreds of years before he was born. Hundreds of years including 29 in just one day, the day that he was killed. This is not a random man that was born. This was a specific man that was sent by God. God sent him on a specific mission and he wanted us to know who it was. So much so that he gave us 300 prophecies to let us know he intentionally set this man, Jesus, to save us and rescue us. Jesus came to save you, to rescue you from the kingdom of sin, the kingdom of darkness, and bring you into the kingdom of this new king, the kingdom of light. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, God's word says that he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. Church, that's good news for us. Let's stand again as we sing, what child is this? As we ask ourselves this question, what child is this that came to save us? Let's stand together. Eliza and Zoltan Erdos, come tell us from God's word about this baby that was born and given to us, prophesied from the Old Testament so that we would know who to look for as he came. For to us a child is born to for to us a child is born to us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulders and his name shall be called wonderful counselor mighty god everlasting father prince of peace of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end on the throne of david and over his kingdom to establish and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore the zeal of the lord of hosts will do this Church, prophecy from the Old Testament telling us of this great God, this God that we can be looking for to bring this victory. You guys can be seated. God has given us the greatest gift. It's this gift of a kingdom that can't be shaken, a kingdom that's forever because the gift is God himself coming as a baby and he can't be shaken. No one will be turned away if they believe in their heart and confess with their mouth that he is the king, he is the rescuer. In John 6, 29, Jesus actually said, this is the work of God. So, you know, when I'm 18, I wanna do the work of God to try to pay him back. And I can't pay back that billion dollar ransom. He says, you wanna do the work of God? Here's the work of God. This is what you do. He says, believe in the one that God sent. Believe in the rescuer, the king the God the Father purposely sent to save you. Believe in him. That's the work of God. And a few verses later, Jesus says, everyone that the Father gives to me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will not cast them out. He will not turn you away. If you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth saying, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that even my little sins are big sins to you. And I need a rescuer. I'm not as good as I thought I was because now I see that I'm sinning against a holy God. If you believe that, he won't turn you away. There is a war going inside of all of us of, of belief and unbelief, of pride and humility. Some of you want to believe and some of you refuse to believe even though there's something that's gnawing at you. But Christ was sent to rescue us from the power of the kingdom of sin and death. And he paid that full price of that ransom that you and I could not afford. And he leaves nothing left for us to do. It's hard to receive this for a lot of us because we're, we're kind of just by nature prideful people. We're self-made men and women. We want to take credit for our own accomplishments, our own morality, our own standards. And we, we treat sin against God as if it's not really a big deal. No, it's just not that big a deal. It's not a big sin. 
But that's a tragedy if we see it that way. But nonetheless, the word says, if we humble ourselves and admit this to God, I know I've sinned against you. He will lift us up. He will rescue us. He will save us. And I don't want anyone in here to have any kind of false hope. I don't want you to trust in yourself, trust in your own goodness, your own righteousness. Every single one of us is going to have to reconcile the debt that has been incurred by sin. And I'm telling you, it's not a debt that you can afford. You cannot afford to pay it back this debt. If you ever, kids, let me ask you a question. If you jump out of an airplane, do you trust in your ability to fly or do you trust in the parachute that's strapped to your back? The parachute, right? There is gonna come a day, church, where we're gonna jump out from this life into the next life. Don't trust in your own righteousness to make it into the next life. Don't do that. Trust in this, this parachute, this rescuer, Jesus Christ, who was sent specifically to save us because we cannot. We cannot. Jesus says this in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he will die, we all will, yet he will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never actually truly die. And he asked this question. I want to ask you this question tonight. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? That you can put your trust in Christ? I want to close with this. This is um, something I just, I like to share because it's easy. It's easy to remember this. So like maybe tonight you're kind of going, I've heard this before, but I've never really wrestled with it enough. This is an easy way to kind of go from here. You go home tonight, the next day, the next couple of days, you kind of remember this very simple way to think about how do I put my trust in Christ? I just call it the ABCs of salvation. The first one, the A, is you, you admit, you know what, my, my sin is bigger than I thought. I do need a rescuer. I've sinned. I've, I've maybe done small sins in my eyes, but they're actually big sins, and I admit that. The next thing, the B, is believe that God sent a rescuer to save you, to to pay that ransom for you because you could not do it. Believe that God did this and he told us who it would be ahead of time so that we wouldn't miss it. And then the C is confess your faith in him. Say, I want to put my trust not in myself, not in my righteousness, not in my goodness, not in my morality, But God, I need this great gift that you've given. I need Jesus to save me. I need him to be my Lord, my Savior. I need him to be my God. And I'd just like you, everyone, all of us, just to consider those things. Consider what Christ has done for us. Now tonight, as we close up our time, we're going to take communion together, as we always do. But before we take communion... We're going to sing about this rescuer. We're going to sing about this great rescuer who came, this king who came to save us from the depths of sin.